So hello everyone, welcome to this fireside chat entitled The Airs Observed by the Machines. My name is Pedro Gamisi and I work as the group leader of AI for RS at the Institute of Advanced Research in Artificial Intelligence or ERA in short, which is located in Vienna. I also work as the head of the machine learning group at AZDR Heath, which is located in Germany. Well, machine learning for Earth observation or remote sensing um, is a mature field of research. For example, advanced machine learning techniques have been developed and, and utilized for a variety of applications, such as urban management and developments, land use and land cover mapping, forest related applications, crop monitoring, climatology, environmental mapping, and so on. Well, what is remote sensing or RS? What is Earth observation or EO? I'll talk about them later on in these fireside chats. Well, the main purpose of this chat is to, to investigate some of the challenges existing in the field of Earth observation and explore how AI and EO can help each other to address these challenges. Well, before starting the chat, I would like to, to introduce our guests, Naoto Yokoya, Ronnie Hensch, and Fabio Pachibici. Naoto works as a lecturer at, at the University of Tokyo. He's also a unit leader at the Riken Center for Advanced Intelligence Project, which is located in Tokyo. Naoto was the previous chair of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society Image Analysis and Data Fusion Technical Committee. His research interests include image processing, data fusion, and machine learning for understanding remote sensing images with applications to disaster management and environmental monitoring. Ronnie works as a research scientist at German Aerospace Center, or DLR. Uh, he is now the chair of IEEE GRSS Image Analysis and Data Fusion Technical Committee. His research uh, interests uh, focus on ensemble methods and deep learning for the analysis of remote sensing images with a focus on synthetic aperture radar, which is a particular uh, type of data set, uh, which is used mostly in the uh, remote sensing community. Fabio works as a distinguished scientist at Maxar Technologies. He has 15 years of experience in developing innovative geospatial uh, products with the vision of bringing together the advancements in the satellite industry with the computer vision and artificial uh, intelligence research communities. Well, he serves as uh, the VP of technical activities at IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. In this chat, we will give a short introduction to remote sensing and some of its challenges where a tight synergy between RS and AI can offer solutions. We will then uh, discuss a few differences between computer vision or to be exact, uh, uh, close range computer vision and Earth observation task. And uh, we also mentioned why most of uh, successful approaches in computer vision cannot be directly applied to remote sensing data. In addition, we discuss how a strong synergy between industry, academia, and government agencies can better serve the broader remote sensing and AI community. Let me uh, start with a brief introduction. And after that, uh, uh, Roni, Naoto, and Fabio will uh, give short talks about different aspects of EO and AI. What is AI for EO? Well, this fireside chat is co-hosted by E-Ray and IEEE GRSS at ICML. So I believe you have a very good understanding of AI. So here I would like to focus a bit more on the EO part. What is EO or what is remote sensing? The United States Geological Survey or USGS in short, defines remote sensing as a process of detecting and monitoring the physical characteristics of an area by measuring its reflected and emitted radiation from a distance. Well, these can be done using special cameras or sensors that are mounted on different platforms, such as airborne platforms, spaceborne platforms, or, or, or for example, drones. These special cameras or sensors um, capture remotely sensed images or data sets from the immediate or almost immediate surface of the Earth. And then researchers like you, researchers like me, uh, will sense, uh, process and analyze these data sets and sense things about the Earth. Well, to process these multi-sensor and heterogeneous data sets, we can make the most of advanced AI techniques and this shapes the backbone of AI for EO. Well, as its name says, AI for EO is an interdisciplinary field of research. In my opinion, if you want to do something out of the box, we need to do interdisciplinary research works. For example, in the AI community, people are developing very sophisticated approaches. 
On the other hand, in the EO community, people are dealing with lots of complex um, scenarios, complex challenges and issues. So a good synergy between these two communities can solve some of the most challenging issues in this world, such as uh, global warming and climate change. Or at least they can offer some good solutions to partially address those problems. We are now in the era of massive data acquisition. In the field of remote sensing, the number of platforms for producing remotely sensed data has sharply increased. This has been coupled with the use of new platforms for proximate sensing, such as unmanned aerial vehicles or, or UAVs producing very fine spatial resolution data. Therefore, we have different sensor types mounted on different platforms, such as airborne, spaceborne, and uh, UAVs. So such heterogeneous, large scale uh, data sets can provide complementary information uh, from a particular scene in, uh, located on the immediate surface of the Earth. And then uh, we can uh, use, for example, we can develop uh, different types of multi-source data fusion approaches to make the most of these data sets with uh, complementary information. So far, so good. We have a huge amount of challenging data sets. We have a huge amount of large scale heterogeneous and high dimensional data sets and, and uh, that are freely available uh, for researchers. But, um, and, and this is exactly what we need in vision communities. But there is a fundamental issue here. The number of labeled training samples is doomed to remain small while the amount of data is huge. Why? Because the collection of label data in remote sensing is either time consuming or expensive. And it can also be dangerous since label data collections sometimes require um, uh, field works in more complex and remote areas. And this is one of the main reasons why many deep learning based approaches cannot be simply adopted for remote sensing images. Well, Roni will talk about uh, these uh, differences in more detail later on, right after my short uh, introduction. So in my opinion, um, this is the most challenging methodological issue in the remote sensing community. Of course, we are dealing with a, a, a lot of uh, challenges, but from the methodological side, in my opinion, this is the most challenging issues. The amount of data, the amount of high dimensional, large scale and heterogeneous data sets are exponentially increasing. But at the same time, we only have a limited number of uh, high quality label samples. There are two general solutions for this problem. We can either invest more and more on field campaigns or, or uh, label data collections to produce high quality training samples, or we can invest more on, on let's call them no supervised approaches. And when I say no supervised approaches, uh, um, I'm uh, referring to a variety of approaches, including unsupervised approaches, semi-supervised approaches, few shot learning, or, or weekly supervised learning. For example, I put a, a, an example here. The first uh, row here shows Earth observation data. The second row shows low quality, inexact, inaccurate, and noisy labels, which need to be used to train our algorithms. And the third uh, row here shows the output classification maps that we uh, produce using these uh, low uh, level, uh, these uh, low quality training samples. And this shapes the general idea behind weekly supervised approaches. Well, um, specifically related to uh, uh, weekly supervised approaches, we organized a couple of events and activities uh, in the remote sensing community in 2020 and 2021 uh, together with our partners at Technical University of Munich and, and uh, Microsoft. And, and uh, Noto will talk about these events, uh, which are specifically related to video supervised learning in more detail later on. Here I'm done uh, with the introduction part, and I think without any further ado, we can uh, proceed with the next presentation, which is going to be given by Roni. Roni, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks, Petron, for this uh, nice introduction before and also for this perfect uh, introduction to, to my part. Um, so I would like to use this time to talk a little bit about the differences between remote sensing data and, and computer vision data. And well, computer vision data, I mean something like, you know, images acquired usually by digital cameras at a, at a near range. So here you see two examples 
Uh, on the left hand side, there is a typical remote sensing data set. Uh, it's a multi spectral LIDAR with the corresponding semantic segmentation. Um, so pixels assigned to each of the, of the uh, labels assigned to each of the pixels. And on the right hand side, you, you see a typical image from the, the Microsoft Coco uh, benchmark data set. So, what is the difference between those two different worlds? Well, one thing is that the, the sensors we are using in close range computer vision, well, they are more intuitive for us to, to interpret. And the reason is that it's dominated by digital cameras, right? Color cameras. So they are designed in a way to match the, the human visual system. So they, they have those three color gen channels, the same as the human eye. Um, green is dominant uh, because the human, the human visual system is very sensitive to green. Um, there's a tone mapping involved in the uh, processing of those images, uh, which aims to produce images that are visually pleasing to, to humans. So it's, it's very easy for us to interpret those, those images because those images are designed to be very close to what we experience in, in, in daily life. On the other hand, for remote sending, it's, it's much closer to actually like a physical measurement of the earth. Um, so for example, we might have very uncommon image geometries. Um, the eye as well as a digital camera is usually like measuring an angle um, of, of the scene. Um, so, you know, where a certain object lands on, on the picture is depending on, on the angle between um, the, um, the, the, um, the, the array of, of, um, of receptors, either camera or eye, uh, and the, the angle between the, to the object. While for synthetic aperture radar, for example, it's more a distance measurement. And this has certain effects like uh, a layover. Uh, so here you see the same building, what you also see here. This is a scene from, from Berlin. Um, so this, this building is basically falling towards the sensor because SAR is rather measuring the distance, which is, makes it very hard even for experts to, to analyze this and interpret this kind of data. Another thing is uh, that in remote sensing, we have very different measurements. So SAR, synthetic aperture radar, is, for example, measuring the amplitude and the phase of a microwave pulse that is backscattered on the ground. Uh, for hyperspectral images, we have hundreds of very narrow spectral bands where we're measuring the, the light intensity. While in close range computer vision, well, we, we have those three colors that we are used to, right? Then we uh, look at the, the visual system of mammals, for example. Another uh, difference is uh, data availability. For close range computer vision, if I want to have example images of a certain object, uh, usually one thing you can do, and in most of the cases, is you just go into the internet and you make an image search, right? There you will find easily thousands up to millions of images um, to some extent already labeled because you can search for this specific object. Now for remote sensing data, uh, the situation is much, much different, right? So here, um, the images are acquired by satellites. Uh, this data is usually not free. Um, or by airborne sensors, where it's uh, very often also not free. The situation is getting a little bit better. So there is now the Copernicus program, for example, that is uh, making the data of, of European satellites, at least the Sentinel, Sentinel constellation, free to the public. For another satellite, you can just like write a science proposal and then you still get the data. But still, I mean, it's much, much harder to, to get this data um, than, than for like close range computer vision problems. Another problem is a standardization. Um, so in closed range computer vision, I mean, we, we do have like PNG or TIFF images, in the worst case, JPEG images, right? So it's very clear what is the data format there. In remote sensing, that is less the case. So usually every kind of sensor, every kind of satellite is coming with its own data format, right? So this also means that you need to have you know, different loaders, different visualization techniques, different pre-processing techniques and so on. For, for each and every uh, of the different sensors that we have. And the biggest problem, and that was already mentioned by Petram, is the labels, right? So now for machine learning in general, but now with deep learning, uh, what we need is labels. And well, in close range computer vision, what you can do, what is heavily done is you use laymans to, to label your images. And this is possible, right? So you can use crowdsourcing, for example, you send your images to Amazon Mechanical Turk or whatever crowdsourcing platform you want to use. And the layman's can label those images to a certain extent because they, they correspond to like daily objects, like there's a car, there's a person, there's a certain kind of animal in this image. So this is something nearly everybody can do. 
In remote sending, it's harder. Um, so if you talk about optical remote sensing images, then maybe people still can do that. But if you talk about um, radar images, or perhaps spectral images, you need uh, expert knowledge in order to, to really do this. And very, very often, even, by, even as an expert, by looking at the data, you can't label it. Um, when we talk, for example, about geophysical properties of the ground, like soil moisture, you can't look at an image and, and as an expert say, this image, uh, this part of the ground has a certain soil moisture, it's just not working. So for this, you would need to, to have in situ measurements. This means you actually need to go to this place and measure it there. Another difference is that in close range computer vision, we usually have like thin classes, like objects. There's a person, there's a certain type of animal. And for this kind of classes, uh, what you can use are, uh, um, are part-based models, right? Um, that was very successful in, in, in computer vision for a long time. Now in remote sensing, we rather deal with stuff classes. So we also have objects like um, uh, airplane detection or ship detection or car detection, but mostly we deal with stuff classes. So things that are just like spread out in arbitrary shapes. So here part-based models or shape-based models are completely useless. There is no common shape of a forest or something like this. So those approaches simply won't work. And the other uh, problem we have is that in close range uh, computer vision, since we are mostly dealing with objects, the labels are quite clear and discrete. A cat is a cat, right? So this part of the image belongs to a cat and another part does not belong to a cat. For remote sending, the labels, uh, well, the classes we are dealing with, they are much more continuous. So is this image here on the left hand side, is this a forest or a road? Oh, it's showing kind of both, but how would you label it? Same on the other hand, so there's a couple of single trees, so probably this one you would not call a forest anymore, uh, but this here in the middle, maybe yes. So it's much, much harder to really assign a single label to, to this kind of image data. And this also, uh, uh, one other reason for this is that the classes we are dealing with, they're much more ambiguous. So when we talk about road, for example, is um, the parking lot in front of a supermarket, does it belong to the class of road? What about the runway of an airport? Uh, what about a dirt path through an agricultural field? So it's much less clear what actually belongs to a specific semantic class we might want to define. Another difference is resolution. Um, in close range computer vision, we have usually high resolution data with a couple of exceptions. Uh, so much so that one of the most common pre-processing steps for, for many computer vision pipelines is actually to downscale your images because we do not need to have this high resolution in order to make the decisions we're interested in. In remote sensing, it's the other way around. So here, especially when we talk about space-borne sensors, the resolution is usually uh, lower than we would like to. So there's a lot of effort in upscaling the images to a higher resolution. And same is also true for, some, uh, for the reference data that we have. So very often the reference data, like in this case, the semantic maps, um, but also other things like geophysical properties, and they are integrated over a larger area, leading to a very coarse resolution a map of our target variables. All right, so this is, sounds like you know, remote sensing only has a kind of like disadvantages, but of course there are also a couple of things that makes it a little bit easier in, in uh, contrast to computer vision. One thing is object scale. For computer vision, you basically don't know the scale of the object. The distance between your sensor and the object is arbitrary, it can be very far away, it can be also very close. And this is in, introducing a lot of change in the appearance of your objects. For remote sensing, usually the object scale is fixed because you do know the, the distance between the object and uh, the, the sensor, right? So satellites fly in a certain orbit, uh, planes uh, follow a certain flight path. So you do more or less know the distance and this the object scale. And the other uh, difference is, is that for remote sensing, since we are closer to the actual physical measurement, um, we very often have physical models that are linking our observables with the target variables we have in mind in particular when we talk about geophysical properties. Um, so those models can be used in order to constrain the solutions you want to find with, with machine learning, for example, as a regularization term, for example, um, or just like uh, restricting the solution space of, of a neural network or something like this. So those differences lead to a couple of uh, differences, uh, a couple of challenges. So the first thing is that our data sets are very small, very, very often just a single image. Uh, this is getting better and better. So there are more and more data sets that are larger than that. But a lot of research is done uh, still on a very small uh, data sets that does not cover all the data variations you might see in practice. So 
Self-supervised learning and uh, domain adaptation, transfer learning is very, very important in remote sensing, much more than in computer vision maybe. And we have a very strong spatial correlation because our objects are very big and homogeneous in the images, both in appearance, but also in semantic, uh, in semantic meaning. And the other thing is we have really a significant amount of label noise uh, when we work with outdated maps, for example, or misalignment issues, but also if you have uh, human experts labeling that, because as I mentioned before, the definition of the classes is, is much more unclear. So here you see like four people try to label road. If they agreed on, on the label, it's red. Uh, so then four, four of the labelers uh, agreed that this is road. Uh, if it's a different color, then they disagreed, right? So it's usually, as I said before, parking lots. Uh, the runway of an airport and one person even labeled uh, like a railway as part of the road network. And last but not least, uh, we have very imbalanced label distributions because well, for Earth observations, some classes appear just much more often than other classes, right? They are just rarer than, uh, I don't know, urban areas, for example. And this is something we, we always have to deal with. Um, so all of this makes remote sensing a, a very exciting uh, research field with a lot of challenges that can be solved with machine learning. And I think that that's what, uh, why you're here and what we want to talk about. All right, and with this, um, I'm, I'm at the end and uh, we can continue with the next speaker. Thank you very much, Ronnie. One of the questions is, I'm interested in approaches regarding limited high quality samples and strategies to overcome this. What would be a good place to start? Right after Ronnie, uh, Naoto will talk about uh, some of the activities that we organize related to weekly supervised approaches. Maybe you can get your answer there. Otherwise, uh, we can uh, surely discuss this in more detail uh, right after all the presentations. So asks uh, if data for remote sensing is hard to acquire, is there demand in studying methods to plan where to acquire data such that optimal amount of information is gained? Yeah, so just to clarify, um, the data itself is not so hard to acquire. There are more and more satellite missions. There's now a lot of airborne sensors available, even drones that are getting more and more affordable. So acquiring the data is not so much the issue. Uh, what is the issue is acquiring label data because this is usually very hard right, for, for different reasons. And yes, there's a lot of work going on in the remote sensing community to, to cope with this um, because very often we are in the situation that we either have few uh, high quality labels or a lot of uh, bad labels like coarse resolution or outdated or slightly misaligned right syntaxes. And there are quite some approaches um, or also research efforts still going on to, to cope with this. Um, trying to adapt self-supervised learning methods, for example, borrowed from, uh, from general computer vision, but also weekly supervised approaches or semi-supervised approaches. Um, so there is a lot of research going on, a little bit still like, you know, like borrowing stuff only from the computer vision community and applying it to the remote sensing data. But slowly we are also getting there that the field is more mature and we are developing methods that are specialized to the data we are actually working with. Thank you very much, Rani. Maybe we, we can go for one more question and then we can uh, continue with the presentations. About the label problem, has one tried to apply deep reinforcement learning, e.g. Uh, the uh, reward function aims at detecting clusters in the pixel feature space for each class? Oh, that's a very precise question. Um, so I think in general, most of the methods available in machine learning computer vision has been tried to be applied to remote sensing data in, in one way or another. So if this was you know, at some point successful in computer vision, then I'm pretty sure there's also a remote sensing paper that, that tried that out. Uh, in general, though, um, at least to my knowledge, re uh, reinforcement learning is, is not a very common approach in the semantic analysis or even uh, of remote sensing data, or even if we go for like uh, geophysical properties. It's, it's seldomly done um, because the supervision signal you have there is, is too too weak. And it's it's not that easy to, to simulate. So if you do reinforcement learning in, in computer vision approaches, you usually do this in scenarios where you can uh, run uh, you know, a couple of hundreds or thousands simulations in parallel. So, you know, and then you accumulate that. If you just have a real physical agent, like one robot that has to do reinforcement learning, usually you don't do it there. 
maybe if you have uh, like hundreds of robots that are doing that and then you accumulate, then you do this. And in remote sensing, we barely can do this. So I have not seen too many approaches uh, with respect to that. Thank you very much, Rani. Um, My pleasure. Nauta, would you like to continue? Sure, I'm Nauta Yuka, uh, a lecturer at the University of Tokyo and also a unit leader at RIKEN AIP. So today I would like to shortly talk about uh, how to deal with the lack of training data in Earth observation, which is already mentioned by Petron and Ronnie as one of the major challenges in this domain. So I would like to introduce two, two examples. The time is limited, so just two examples. Um, one of them is, yeah, let's let's use what we already have. So it's a kind of learning from weak supervision, uh, which is already mentioned by Pedram, Ronnie. So we already have some sort of GIS data. Some, for example, OpenStreetMap is open map information. And also there are uh, map products uh, made from coarse or medium resolution satellite imagery, which is not perfect, but uh, better than nothing if we do not have enough uh, labels. And another uh, approach is to, yeah, let's generate what we want. So if we don't have uh, data and if we can somehow generate them, so, for instance, if we have any numerical models to simulate the, what we want to predict, we can use numerical simulation to create uh, data. And also, we can think about uh, applying generative models to uh, synthesize the data to increase the volume of the data. So it's more related to learning from synthetic data or uh, some domain uh, adaptation to fill the domain gap. But uh, the concept is, to, yeah, let's let's create the data. So let me start from the first one, so which is already mentioned by Pedram. So I and actually Ronnie and Pedram, we all together uh, organized uh, uh, international uh, data science competition, which is uh, called uh, IEEE GLSS Data Fusion Contest. And this year and last year. Uh, the topic was focused on land cover mapping, which is a semantic segmentation with weak supervision. For example, last year, uh, the task was to classify every single pixel at uh, one meter ground sampling distance using radar image and also optical imagery uh, using uh, coarse resolution labels, uh, as shown on the right hand side. So actually, we have this kind of coarse resolution at 500 meter ground sampling distance. So each pixel uh, is approximately uh, spacing around 500 meter. So we, we already have the global uh, semantic segmentation map or the whole globe. So why not to use uh, such labels to create a high resolution uh, classification map? So here, high resolution, we mean uh, with the 10 meter. So try to use this kind of uh, coarse resolution. And this is not only coarse resolution, but quite noisy. So include a lot of uh, noise, uh, label noise. And as a follow-up of the last year's competition, this year, uh, we also organized the change detection uh, competition, so semantic change detection. So the task was uh, uh, a bit different, but the concept is quite similar. So let's use 30 meter uh, resolution labels for training and try to create a uh, land cover map at one meter in order to detect uh, what kind of land cover change to uh, what kind of land cover. So some examples as shown on the right hand side and the examples of input imagery and uh, also medium resolution labels are shown on the left hand side. So this kind of task is related to learning from noisy labels or learning from aggregated uh, information. So those, uh, I think those topics are also actively studied in machine learning community. And this is really important in our applications. So another uh, example is, uh, yeah, let's create the data if there is no data. 
Uh, let me uh, explain through just one example. So uh, I'm from Japan and this uh, Japan is um, suffering from a lot of different uh, types of disasters. And this is an example of two years ago, there was a big typhoon and this is optical imagery before disaster and this is after the disaster. So usually it's covered by cloud and usually uh, if it's covered by cloud, we cannot see the ground. So in this case, uh, we need to use radar image, which uh, we can acquire our images under any uh, weather condition. So this is the pre-disaster radar image. And this one is the post-disaster uh, SAR imagery. And uh, you can see that uh, some pixels get darker and actually, if there is no elevated objects, backscattling signal decreases, so it becomes darker. But in urban area where there are many elevated objects, backscattering uh, becomes rather stronger. So if we make a color composite image, it looks like this. So we assign pre and post uh, uh, disaster images for RGB. So those colorful pixels indicates an existence of water. And by performing simple image processing, actually we can detect a flooded uh, region. And this is a kind of quite basic uh, map that we need to provide as a first initial uh, disaster response. Uh, but this information is not enough because uh, when flooding happened, if the flooding was just 50 centimeters, so inundation depth was 50 centimeters or three meters, it mean, they mean totally different damages on the buildings. So we need to predict uh, inundation depths. Um, there is a, a classic approach, but uh, uh, our approach was based on uh, numerical simulation and uh, machine learning. So actually, it was first time to apply a deep learning approach to the radar image uh, to predict the inundation depths as in through the real disaster response. And of course, uh, there is an agency uh, responsible for uh, disaster management. They publish inundation depths. Um, this is shown on the right hand side. And this map is based on visual interpretation of aerial photo. So humans interpret the aerial photo and then use this uh, flood detection map together with uh, digital elevation model to, to estimate the uh, inundation depths. And uh, our approach uh, could uh, output something consistent with uh, what was done by humans. So it shows uh, quite good potential to speed up the disaster response and to, to provide information that uh, people needed during the disaster response. And uh, let me explain what, what, what is behind uh, this. So remote sensing is just observing what some, uh, this is just observation. And by analyzing image, we can, we can estimate uh, which pixels were changed. But usually it's include false positive or false negatives. And it's not, it's not so easy to uh, estimate, for example, inundation depths or when debris flow happen. It's, it's, it's not easy to estimate the uh, topographic deformation. So on the other hand, there are some numerical simulation people who, who have some uh, simulation uh, numerical models to simulate uh, debris flow or flooding. So if we set up some parameters or input, we can uh, simulate something. And of course, we can link uh, binary change information and more detailed information like inundation depths and topographic deformation. Um, by changing parameters or input, we can simulate many, many different cases, but also it's not that easy to get accurate input and parameter very quickly. So it really takes time to tune everything to fit the simulation to the reality. But uh, uh, we found that the, this simulation data uh, could be used for the training data to build up the inverse model to predict um, inundation depths and deformation, uh, topographic deformation. So the idea is 
So those topographic deformation or maximum water level, uh, it's really hard to collect such training data uh, by field survey. So uh, numerical simulation can be used to create uh, such data. So once we build up this inverse model, we can just apply this model to the uh, image analysis result. So that, that it, this is the, the main idea behind uh, what I introduced in the inundation depth estimation. So here is here are some examples for WFOs. So conventional approaches were limited to those results shown at the middle and by uh, using uh, synthetic data, we can predict uh, where the soil eroded and where the soil deposit. So lastly, I would like to introduce a bit about uh, how to create images. So which is a hot topic in computer vision. So maybe some of you wondered uh, in this slide, uh, so in this slide, if we can uh, synthesize remote sensing imagery, maybe we can get rid of this finally change information layer. So that was our motivation. So if we know digital elevation model, which is kind of depth information from the sky and label information, and now we can synthesize this kind of quite realistic uh, optical imagery. So th this is a actually fake image. It looks looks good, but fake image. And this is the original RGB imagery. And by manipulating those uh, them and uh, label information, as shown on the right hand side at the top. So here we just increase forest and get rid of some man-made objects, and then uh, the generative model can create the corresponding very realistic imagery. So image synthesis from labels is quite common, but we also use them because uh, if we just use label information, as you can show, as you can see on the right hand side bottom, the, the diversity of the buildings are not that great. So more information we use as a condition, better images we can get. So general models can be used to manipulate the images and think the science and um, images even uh, which do not exist in this world. So here are more examples. So actually a third row is the synthesized images and the last row is the real images. For RGB, and this is there for radar, honestly speaking, I, I cannot discriminate which one is real and which one is synthesized for the radar image. And this is an example, just uh, we uh, just manipulate the elevation and semantic labels, just increase the sea level. And then you can see uh, the synthesized images uh, shows the more, more and more water uh, regions. So this is a simple example, but uh, we are planning to apply this kind of generative models to increase uh, um, the number of images and in introduce more diversity, something like uh, seasons or some observation conditions and so on to, in order to uh, augment the image so which might be helpful to deal with lack of training data yeah from my side that's that's all thank you thanks a lot i do see some questions related to your part here so i'm interested in working on uh, real fires but all the labels i can usually get are based on bai or ndr how can i find out whether my methods are usually better if I only have these labels? Uh, wildfire detection is, to, to my experience, it's, it's relatively e easy if we, if we can use some thermal imagery or if we can have uh, some optical imagery, including short wave ranks, um, which is we usually call a sphere. Suya range, uh, which is also sens uh, sensitive to uh, the temperature. But if we have thermal imagery, definitely we, we can, it, it, it's not that difficult to get a quite highly accurate uh, detection map. So uh, I I'm not sure what kind of data uh, he or she is using, but uh, I think, uh, 
together with experts and using proper data, I think you can create quite precise uh, label data, which can be used for the precise evaluation. Thank you very much, uh, Noto. Well, actually, this uh, partially answers Mishai's question as well. Uh, you know, in the remote sensing community, we of course have a lot of benchmark data sets. And for example, uh, I3P image analysis and data fusion technical committee um, are producing more and more benchmark data sets and, and, uh, and uh, organize more and more uh, competitions based on those benchmark data sets. But the type of the data is completely different. Um, so, so we have different types of data and we have different types of applications. So uh, uh, we cannot uh, validate, for example, one particular deep learning based approach for, for uh, which works, for example, for one data set, and then we can generalize it to other types of data. So for example, um, Hyperspace, most of the approaches which have been developed, for example, for RGB images is not applicable to hyperspectral images because of the care of dimensionality. So uh, yes, of course, we have a, a lot of uh, benchmark data sets in the community. And, and for some particular applications, for example, wildfire, for example, as mentioned here, maybe we don't have any uh, particular uh, benchmark data sets. So, uh, Hopefully, hopefully in the near future, we can have uh, more data sets uh, specifically related to different types of applications. And, and uh, one of the uh, activities that we followed uh, in IEEE image analysis and data fusion technical committee was that we noticed that we have a lot of data, but those data sets have been um, um, saved in different, in different uh, data repositories, for example. Each of uh, those data sets have been uploaded in a personal web website, for example. So, so one of the activities that we are following now is to develop a database in which people can find different types of benchmark data sets with respect to their applications, with respect to the data that's uh, used to produce those data sets and with respect to geolocations. But, but uh, it's an ongoing project and, and, and uh, I believe uh, we will soon have this database running. So, uh, Ronnie, uh, would you like to, to provide some more information about uh, about this database EOD? Um, sure. Um, so, one problem with remote sensing is that we do have a lot of different sensors available, and we have um, also a lot of different tasks we are interested in. Right. So, the combination between input and output uh, is, is really really big. Uh, and there is a lot of data available in the remote sensing community, but usually it lies on some kind of like private servers, you know, like one university group was providing some data or maybe like we as a technical committee from GSS are making a benchmark, but there is no general place to really search this, right? Uh, so the idea was that we create a catalog where you, you make all of those data searchable. So you display them on a map, you uh, attach attributes to them, like what kind of sensory data is there, what is the geolocation? What is the, the, the nature of the reference data that is available? So um, you, you try to put all of this into a catalog and then this catalog, you can just interactively browse. Uh, so you can like look through everything, you can sort it, you can filter it, you can display it on, on the map. Um, so this is from the user's perspective. If you're looking for a specific benchmark data set at a specific location, for example, for a specific task, then you can just go there. And if you're a data provider, so you actually have created such a benchmark data set, you can also go there and just enter it to the catalog. So it's not just us who is putting our data there. Uh, it's meant for the for the whole community that they can you know, update this, this catalog uh, on when, whenever new data is available, while the data itself is hosted somewhere else. So this is really just like uh, hosting the meta information of all this data. Um, this is hopefully coming online in a month, and then hopefully this will push the community a little bit forward. Thank you very much, Rani. So, um, oh, Pedro, I, 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 sorry, I, I just read the chat and uh, I, I got the point of the question. Sure, please go so ahead. I think the question was about, so if the reference is based on uh, a simple model or simple method, uh, how, the, how we can evaluate uh, uh, new, the performance of the new method, right? So my, my answer would be, if the reference is really fully based on the simple method, we, we cannot evaluate. Uh, we, we can just evaluate whether a machine learning based approach can reproduce 
the result of the simple method. So if we really want to evaluate precisely, we really need help of expert or field survey to get more precise uh, reference data. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nota. So I think we can proceed with uh, Fabio's talk as well. Fabio, would you like to continue? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the introduction earlier, Pedram. I'm um, excited to be here. What are we going to be talking about today? Uh, I would like to cover a few topics. I would like to talk about why GUI is difficult. And I would like to give a little more perspective, especially from a data provider, on what are some of the issues that, uh, that we are facing. Then I would like to talk about a little bit of open science, open data, open standards. And I would like to bring up a couple of examples about, for example, SpaceNet and the work that the industry is doing towards a sort of standard called ARD analysis ready data. And finally, I would like to talk about how GOI can be more impactful, especially talking about the SDG from the United Nations. I just want to give a little bit more perspective of why is it difficult. And, but first, I want to talk about what is Maxar. Uh, Maxar is a satellite operator, and we fly a, a constellation of uh, four satellites uh, ranging from 50 to 30 centimeter resolution. And in the next uh, few months, we're going to be launching Worldview Legion, which is a constellation of six additional satellites with eight spectral bands in the range of 30 centimeter. And these additional satellites will allow us to revisit the same point on Earth about 15 times per day. So the, the amount of data that we will be collecting in the, in the near future is, is huge. Let's go a little bit more into the detail about space hardware in general. So color consistency. Uh, some satellites have four bands, other satellites have eight bands. Uh, some of those bands are wider, other are narrower. And depending on all those variabilities, you can see uh, color shift between different sensors. So this is, for example, the same red as seen from two different platforms. Or only touch about atmospheric conditions. I just want to add that in general, atmospheric conditions are not uniform. And you can see the variability here in the A's in this image. So you really want to work on what's called surface reflectance, which basically removes the effects of the, of the atmosphere, making the green in this field similar to the green in this field. And surface reflectance is generally not used very often for a machine learning application. It's uh, often it's very, it's one of those steps that people just oversee and just don't do it. But it's, it's definitely, it's definitely fundamental as it brings you the, to a physical space of what you're collecting. Another aspect is interesting is that often you might only get one band. You might only get the panchromatic band, which is just black and white. Often satellites are not calibrated. And so the, the radiometry you get from one satellite could be completely different from the, the same radiometry you might get to a different, different satellite. And this really goes, it's really counterintuitive. It's not really seen in the, you know, in the classic computer vision field where generally use, you know, like three bands and you're okay with that. Then you have tiny objects. So often you want to detect something that's very small compared to the size of the image. And just because of that, approaches like I don't know, YOLO, for example, will fail miserably. So you want to do something a little bit more tailored for remote sensing. You can see that objects also affect what, uh, what is called a BRDF which is a property of the materials and the structure of the materials. So in this example, you can see there are some rooftops on the left image that is brighter compared to the same rooftop that is darker on the, on the right image. And in both cases, the only thing that changed was this, uh, the, the viewing geometry of the, of the satellite. And so within the same scene, you have objects that are darker in one case or, or brighter in the other case and vice versa. And so those effects are really important when you wanna to try to model for example, what is a billion footprint? What I talk about so far is mostly just the, the spectral differences, but in general, you also have geometrical distortions. And what you see in these slides is that the satellite can collect images from different direction. And when, when you do the orthorectification, buildings still lean in different directions. And even if you do an image alignment, you still see building lean in different directions. And so this really complicates, for example, the generation of labels, because you know one building in one image can be laying in, on the right side and another image can be on the, on the left side. Or for example, could be the image could have been acquired on a deer. And so you are uh, perfectly straight down. In general, one thing that is important is also talking about the sensor altitude uh, compared to the spatial resolution. And what you can see at 80 centimeter resolution is different from what you can see at 30 centimeter resolution. 
In this case, this car is completely not understandable up to maybe like 50 centimeter. We actually did an experiment where we did a bunch of simulation based on the resolution. And you can really see cars with some confidence if you are below, you know, 50 or 40 centimeter. And yeah, you can maybe, be, you're able to detect some cars at a lower resolution, but uh, not with uh, very high confidence. I want to dive a little bit more what it is that some of the industry is working on with some governments or not-for-profit organization. The first example I want to talk about is uh, SpaceNet. SpaceNet is a consortium of different, different companies. In particular, there are like several different companies. We can also see some agencies, some government agencies, and uh, a not-for-profit organization such as GRSS. SpaceNet has been around for, for about five years. In general, you can see that we have run different competitions. Uh, they're mostly focused on mapping challenges, for example, building footprints or road extraction. You can see a variety of different sensors, including from other, from other providers and also like star data. In general, just some numbers, SpaceNet has about 110 uh, different uh, geography with about 11 million of building footprints, uh, 20,000 kilometers of roads. And we put together about $350,000 uh, worth of prizes. There will be more than 3,000 submissions. And we release all 38 algorithms. Most of these uh, is still online and you can run some, some evaluation. Uh, all that runs on uh, top coder. So ARD is one of the standards it's, it's coming out from uh, as a partnership between different companies and uh, for example, NASA, ESA. And it's generally understood a deep stack of tiles or images. Those images are generally curated. Often they're a bit, uh, three bands, and they're ready to be ingested to you know classic machine learning frameworks. There is still like some debate of what is ARD and what uh, analysis ready means for many applications. But I see some consolidation, at least in the industry, uh, where this application is geared towards AI. And most of the reason is because there has been an evolution in the usage of the imagery. So we range from just collecting an image of a parking lot to extract information out of it. And this information is, for example, the number of cars in it. Then the, 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 next, the next part of the evolution will be to actually provide insight. So someone doesn't need to have the remote sensing image, can just extract a report where we see hey, in front of the parking lot, there were 500 cars. So the grocery store, for example, will have more revenue compared to last year. So that's the kind of like evolution. And another application is, for example, uh, running analytics at scale. Uh, so combining the, the huge amount of satellite imagery that you know, the, the industry and, and governments will be collecting in the, in the near future, we'll be able to extract the pulse of the human geography. For example, in, uh, in this example, we see uh, how many cars are crossing the border in Texas, and we can just get a report that say 175 cars passed the border compared to 315 in, uh, in November compared to August. So that is where we are heading you know, with the usage of uh, ARD. I'm going to be talking about uh, the SDGs. Uh, so those are the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Uh, there are 17 goals, and they, they cover different aspects. Uh, for example, no poverty, zero, zero hunger, climate action, clean water, sustainability, all those camps with specific targets. And governments need to be able to measure those targets. And so this is where, in general, GOI can really play a huge factor because it's a, it's a, it's a measurement that can be trusted by, by government to measure their progress towards those uh, SDGs. I have a few examples of how GOI can be applied is um, it's actually an example from uh, the flood in uh, Germany and Central Europe from last week, where can really relate to number 13, which calls for climate action. And, you know, if you've seen the news, you've probably seen many of those images, um, either collecting from optical or, or SAR data. Number two uh, focuses on uh, zero anger. And one application is to rethink how people grow different crops. And for example, in this um, in this image, a satellite image was used to do uh, field segmentation. Uh, number 15 calls for the attention towards uh, maintaining the biodiversity of life and land and reducing the environmental degradation. And one application is, for example, counting trees uh, within, uh, within a neighborhood. In this case, again, AI was used to count trees. 
Number seven call for access to affordable and clean energy. So solar panel detection is uh, it's a relatively easy task uh, when you use you know 50 to 30 centimeter resolution. You can uh, you can definitely see and detect solar panels on uh, not only on those huge uh, solar farms but also on uh, individual houses. I only have a couple more examples. Those are examples where. You can actually touch two different SDGs, in particular the uh, the health and well-being and um, reduce inequality, where GOI can be used for map population density and uh, vaccine distribution. And this experiment, or this uh, this project was done in 2019, so it doesn't have to do anything with COVID in general. It was more meant towards Ebola and eradicating some of those um, diseases in Africa. This is another example where using GeoAI, you can capture a couple of different couple of different SDGs, in particular, uh, no poverty and access to clean water. And those are refugee camps. The red and blue big structure on the uh, left image are administrative buildings, and all the others are tent shelters. And you can see on the right side of the, the image, there are a lot of tents and shelters. Those are commercial uh, people are trying to sell uh, stuff at the refugee camp. On the right side of uh, on the right image, instead, uh, there is a, uh, another refugee camp in Congo. There is a mapping between boreholes and, and tents. So access to water is another thing that's really important to map. And that's another, another place, another use set where GRI can uh, play a fundamental role. That's it for, for me. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fabio. There is already one question for you. Um, uh, will a SpaceNet challenge uh, be organized in 2021 or 2022? Yes, we are working with all the partners. Uh, we actually we are in the in the process of reorganize SpaceNet because we are being adding new partners. And so in the near future, if it's not 2021, it's going to be definitely 2022. Thank you very much. So, uh, Fabio, I have a question from you. Um, how will uh, so how will providers of commercial satellite imagery contribute or steer the construction of training data in the future? Well, definitely, you know, th- there are different providers, uh, both both commercial and and, and government uh, providers. And uh, Ronnie touched on this earlier. There is not really a standard. You know, the JPEG 2000, JPEG. PNGs, TIFF, uh, GeoTIFF, uh, cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, they're all different flavors of the same thing. One way where different people in the industry have tried to steer this is uh, the adoption of that ARD standard, where everything will be providing a cloud-optimized GeoTIFF, everything will be on the cloud, and those styles should uh, follow some definition. Except, For example, they all are A-bit tiles in general, and, and they're all three bands. So they're all try to address the, you know, the AI needs uh, and the usa- usability of a uh, framework that are borrowed from, uh, from other uh, communities. That's one way. Um, definitely there are, there are many, many more ways. Uh, SpaceNet is a good example, for example, to, pro- to create labels. That's, a, that's another way where the industry is trying to, steer, to get together and try to steer the community and create like uh, labels. Thank you very much, Fabio. And what about Python? So uh, in order to answer your question, incredible joy. So if you want to stick to hyperspectral images, there are already uh, quite a bit of libraries, either in MATLAB or Python, uh, which are available in, in the community. For example, you, uh, there are uh, libraries dedicated to denoising or, or resolution enhancement, for example, or in particular classification or diffusion of hyperspectral with any other types of modalities. So uh, there are many codes available for that, but, but, but unfortunately I don't have any, any link to them right now, but if you want, you can send an email to me and I can provide you with some codes. Another questions. So uh, I completely agree with you. So uh, when it comes to applications, I think sustainable development goals or SDGs, which are defined by uh, the United Nations has quite a bit of potential to to, to, uh, make the most of AI and EO at the same time to solve some of those challenges, some of those, to approach some of those targets. In your opinion, how uh, we can connect AI and RS to solve uh, those goals or to approach those goals? Well, I think, first of all, I don't know if remote sensing will be able to solve the goals, but I think we'll create 
we will be able to create metrics to see at least how those goals have been addressed. Uh, for example, accessible, um, measuring the accessible water. It's something that remote sensing can easily see and we can, we can measure how progress has been done. Or for example, county, counting trees or planting new trees. That's something that uh, I feel that's where, you know, GI can really help a lot, not only government, but also uh, NGOs and other groups are working uh, towards addressing uh, some of those those challenges. Um, and I also like to think, you know, out of the box, I, I, I constantly see, uh, especially here in, uh, in the AI uh, field, I constantly see uh, land use land cover or things like that. Uh, think out of the box, there are so many more applications that don't really just focus on land use land cover. And I think we should try to address those as well. A good point, Fabio. In which role uh, does RS have for the Green New Deal in EU? Which SDGs? Definitely life on land. That's one of the most important for uh, Green New Deal. Uh, you want to make sure that life is sustainable. But all of those kind of like touch that. You know, if you if you if you go to the UN website, there is a there is a clear definition of what uh, some of those goals are and what they, they address. And so, in each of them, you can find some pieces of that. That's why it's, it's, I think it's really important to see all those goals as a whole and try to address more goal in within the same uh, within within the same task. Uh, for example, improving quality of life and access to water, they kind of like go together. In my opinion, especially in, in, in many uh, less developed countries. Thank you very much, Fabio. There, there is uh, one more question. So I'm very interested in the research related to the SDGs. For for impactful research, it is important to have partnerships that are in the field. How can we approach these partners to help them? I would say that almost every data provider that this could be commercial or government they are working with partners on addressing some of those SDGs. Uh, so if you're interested, reach out. Uh, we, you know, we can definitely get you in touch with people that might be on the field. Uh, there are many, many NGOs working, uh, for example, to clean up the ocean. Uh, and that's just one, one example. And definitely, I think one thing that I really like about GRSS in general um, at IEEE is that it's a network of professional working towards the same goal. And through this network, you can get in touch with people on the, in the field, with a data provider, with a AI practitioner, and the entire community will help us measure and eventually address uh, the SDGs. And I, I totally agree with that comment that, uh, in my opinion, research should be impactful. I'm not very excited every time I see another land use land cover paper uh, in, the, you know, in the literature. I think we have the expertise to move on from there and try to address some of those, uh, some of those issues that impact people. Thank you very much. I would like to appreciate every and each of you for your participation, for your questions. And I would like to thank uh, Fabio, Roni, and Noto for their very interesting talks. And I would also like to appreciate IEEE GRSS and E-Ray for making this fireside chat happen. Thank you very much and all the best.